All right, OPBC Online, a ministry of Old Pass Baptist Church in Northfield, Minnesota. It's been a while since we've come to you and done one of these. Uh, I've been busy with things this summer, and uh, but I've got Brother Ickes here. How are you doing, Brother Ickes? I'm doing great. He is pastor, one of the pastors at uh, Gateway Anabaptist Church in Monroe, Michigan. Is that correct? That's correct. Monroe. I've been there, but I have to remember. Um, but he has a unique story, and we are starting a series here that I believe is going to be very profitable. Now, you that have listened to this ministry for a while, you know full well that I have dealt with the false doctrines of Roman Catholicism, the papacy, the Jesuit order, and all kinds of things like that in the past. This is a little different. Um, Brother Ickes has a unique testimony. He grew up Catholic and then became a born-again Baptist preacher later on in life. And that's a, an important study. That's an important thing to, to uh, a testimony to have out there for people to know. Uh, and, and, but it's a unique testimony in this sense that Brother Ickes has a lot of things to say about Roman Catholicism and his life in that, that you may not hear from everybody else. It's a very honest from his standpoint of when he grew up and what he went through and everything like that, a testimony that I believe is important to hear. But it's a springboard because this is only the beginning. Lord willing, what we want to do is go from here to further on down the road here, dealing with uh, some of the Catholic.com topics that are there and some of the Catholic catechism and showing you what's not true about that and what the truth is according to the scriptures, according to the word of God, which is our authority uh, for everything concerning the Lord Jesus Christ and and God and, and everything. You know, it's, it's our authority. So um, we want to start this out. And then, you know what, if there's some of you that have some questions about Roman Catholicism, you have some questions about some Catholic doctrines, you know, you can you can go to David Ickes' Facebook page. You can go to mine. You can email me at pastorcooley at iCloud.com. Uh, and you could send us your questions as well, because we may cover them in shows coming up, because we're going to do some more of these, Lord willing, as many as we can. We want the truth to get out there. And first, before we get started, I want to say this to you, that I don't hate Catholics. I'm a Baptist. I'm a hardcore, uh, fundamental Baptist. Uh, you know, I, I, I understand the history of Roman Catholicism. I understand the history of the papacy, but I can differentiate from the Catholic people and the hierarchy of the papacy and other things like that. I know the differences in those two. And it's important that we make that distinction because you know what? There's bad people everywhere. You know, there, there are in Baptist churches and Catholic churches everywhere. But the, the main, the main, thrust of us, the main importance that we have with all of this, the main goal for us is the gospel of Jesus Christ, is for sinners to be saved, and for those that are in false doctrine and don't understand the truth, for them to come out from that, and for them to be saved by the grace of God. We want people to be saved. That's what God called us to do, is preach the gospel, and that's what we're here to do, is preach the gospel and preach the truth to people. But you have to understand what people believe, the false things that people believe, before you can really teach them the truth and, and, and help them to understand it. You know, they gotta, they got to have an understanding. of you got to have a basis and understanding of where these people are coming from. And I think today right. what you're going to see brother Ick, from Brother Ickes is a different side of Roman Catholicism that you haven't heard. Uh, his story is a little unique. So, Brother Ickes, without further ado, I'm going to let you get started here, and I'll interrupt you like I'm good at doing here. Uh, but I want you to tell your story and your testimony of of how you grew up and how you came to the faith and how you left Roman Catholicism and became a born-again Baptist preacher and what the Lord did with all of that. So let's get started with that, brother. Okay, amen. Well, most of what uh, I found that Baptists have learned about Roman Catholicism come from people who um, attack Roman Catholicism, but really set up straw men and knock them down. It's a little more complex than what uh, most non-Catholics that are Baptists now have ever heard. Um, so all I can do is give a testimony to what I know. I, w I was raised Roman Catholic in Detroit, Michigan. And went to uh, 
Catholic schools for up through my senior year of high school. I was an altar boy from, I think it's grade six through eight at the local parish in my neighborhood. And I guess the older that I get, uh, you re I've reflected back on my life and my upbringing and have been very thankful for it. And that, that, that um, might rub people the wrong way, but what, what I think we're going to try to do with this series is try to make sure that um, we tell the truth about Ro Roman Catholicism from the perspective that a former Roman Catholic might have that you haven't heard about. And so I'm not even going to say my experience with the Roman Catholic Church is atypical. I'm going to say it's typical. Um, we hear the horror stories of the abuses and things like that from priests, and those have happened, unfortunately. But then if you step back and just look at it objectively, that happens everywhere. Yes. Baptists, Baptists, Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses, Hindus, <laughs> Muslims. Sin you, you, knows. You sin knows Correct. no no. Uh, it's no respecter of persons. It knows nothing. You know. Correct. Um, That's right. And 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 just knowing the biblical truth of the sin nature of man, it happens everywhere. So, it's really not a good way to um, discredit the Roman Catholic Church is to just point to those things because then you've just discredited anything and everything um, that purports to be of God. Um, so we have to deal with the actual doctrines and the scriptures to actually do that. And that's what, what I think we're going to, we're at least intending to do throughout however long this series goes. But we want to start out with um, at least me giving uh, my testimony and how great my Catholic upbringing was. I mean, I can smile about it, and anybody that knows me that's, that's watching this, because I'm still in contact with some of my old friends that I grew up with, mm -hmm. um, and many of them are still Roman Catholics. Not all of them, but many of them. And they will attest to how great our neighborhood was, how, 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 how awesome our childhood was growing up in a Roman Catholic type culture. I don't remember anything bad happening to me um, as, a, as a kid or as an altar boy, um, the neighborhood. Um, okay, let, let's stop there for a second because, sure. you know, I, I think it's important to cover that um, a little bit into detail here. Uh, you know, because a lot of people, the, the moment that you hear about something bad happening, that it's all Roman Catholics that are like this bunch of child molesters that are out right, running so, around yeah. uh, destroying children's lives and, yes. and doing everything. And I have to believe that that's not the case, that that's, prob not. that's not true. It, you know, there's some dirty, rotten people everywhere that sin and, and that live wickedly and do things, but that doesn't mean that everybody is. That doesn't mean that all of them are. And, right, exactly. You know, you didn't have that experience, right? You were an altar boy. You grew up, and your friends there. You had, you didn't hear about any bad experiences with them. They, they, the the priests uh, weren't like that to you guys or whatever. Right. Like I can speak to to at least my parish, and several other ones that were in the local vicinity. Because when I went to Catholic high school, I went to an all boys Catholic prep uh, college prep school, Catholic school there, which was great. I mean, that's the way you educate. Uh, young men is is you 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 it's all boys school. That's the way you do it. There were some all girls Catholic schools, and there were all boys. There was an all boy Catholic school, you know, at least in my side of town. Um, and I went to that school, and the education was top notch. Uh, you you can't beat it. Uh, you you just can't. So, I guess I'm trying to give this testimony to explain how the Roman Catholic culture is good. Um, at least in my experience, it was fantastic. It was unifying. Um, the the way they the way they uh, do things in a parish um, was community oriented. Okay, it was so, family. so l l let me stop you for a second because I just want to reiterate this point. So sure. David Ickes didn't run out of the Roman Catholic Church because of you know atrocities that were committed to his family or to him. And, right. you know, that's not why you left. You grew up Catholic from the time you were what age, David? From the time I was born. Okay. So you were born Catholic. So, yes. so, so born into the Catholic family, mm -hmm. uh, went through all of those things in your parish and then never had the, the, the terrible experiences mm -hmm. 
that were prevalent that you hear about in some things. Now, right. I will say this, that, that I, I just want to say this because there's this movement out there to destroy anything traditional today mm -hmm. and, and to kind of vilify everything, whether it's a Catholic church, a Baptist church, a, a, a Lutheran church, a Presbyterian church. There's actually Mormons, whatever. There's actually good, kind people in all those places. Now, notice, I'm not exactly. saying they're all saved. I'm saying right. they're good, kind people that loved people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's not the reason why people, you know, leave Roman Catholicism or leave something else. It, it, you know, it could be, it could be something God would use in any church. But, you know, that's fear-based things that people try to do to make them afraid of everything. David right. Cobb wrote, wrote recently on an article about that, about the IFB movement and how they, the, this company, they, this, um, not company, I'm sorry, they, these uh, reporters, whatever they were, found the most atrocious um, wickedness that went on in some IFB churches and, you know, tried to label the whole movement and scare everybody and act like, well, every, every church is this way and every, everything. And that's not the case, you exactly. know? And so I, I just want to make sure, I just want to make that plain because, you know, a lot of people that's, you look at what you're going to find is that David X is going to show you is it's truth that matters above all things. Absolutely, and it, it boils down to the scriptures. But here's here's one thing that I found over the decades now since I've been born again is that it it started to annoy me when I would hear caricatures of the Roman Catholic Church from people that really don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> they weren't raised in a Roman Catholic family. They weren't raised in a Roman Catholic culture. They didn't go to Catholic schools. They weren't altar boys, but yet they're speaking for all, all of us as if they somehow know. And it, it would bother me because it's like, I know that you're not going to reach. If the typical Catholic upbringing was the same as mine, which was good, then you're never going to reach them by setting up straw man and, and, and mischaracterizing what they understand the Roman Catholic Church to represent and attacking that straw man. You're, not, you're just not going to get anywhere. So let's just cut to the chase, talk about the good uh, and the reality of it, and then we can start dealing with the doctrines. So that's why we're, I think that's, that's why we're dealing doing. with that now in the, in the introduction is to try to disarm this idea that we're attacking Roman Catholic people. And we're trying to make a distinction between the Roman Catholic culture, the Roman Catholic upbringing, the Roman Catholic individual is, is different than Roman Catholic doctrine. And, and I found as I've, uh, gotten older that what I thought the Roman Catholic Church or what I believed isn't even what the Roman Catholic Church teaches and a lot of the things that um, are attacked uh, by non-Catholics aren't even things that the Roman Catholic Church ever majored on, at least in my experience and those are the uh, experiences of those that I know. And so I, I can only look back and, 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 and see nothing but good in the, in the upbringing that I had in the Roman Catholic Church. And so uh, I want to I want to say that up front on how good my upbringing was and how family oriented that it was and how community oriented that it was and how charitable that it was and how it, 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 it forced you to think about others. It taught us those things to do unto others and to um, to love your neighbor and to take marriage seriously and to raise your own kids and take responsibility as a man and to um, you know, and instill these traditions and 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 truths. against and against abortion and and birth control Absolutely. and and, yes. and those things too as well. Very strong stand, uh, moral and mm -hmm. good stands mm -hmm. that the Bible would. And true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That's right. And and I think uh, I mentioned this to you uh, before we started the show. Is Spurgeon made a statement along the lines of discernment is not knowing the difference between right and wrong. It's knowing the difference between right and almost right. Yes. And that, and that is so true because that's where the devil can get into the details is when something is just this close to being 100% across the board, right? It, it's harder to detect where the error is at. And so as we go through the doctrines, we'll, we'll point out where the errors are doctrinally. Mm-hmm. 
but let's at least up front lay it out on the table that that there are a lot of good things about uh, the Roman Catholic Church and, and, and those kinds of things. I can even say that in my own personal salvation testimony, when I actually got born again at the age of 24, that Roman Catholic doctrine played a role in that, in that uh, the Roman Catholic Church really drills it into you how bad you are. They, right, they, so, they just stay just flat out tell you the law, the law, the law, right? And Paul said the law is the schoolmaster that brings us to Christ. The law, the law, the law. Uh, you've done wrong. You need to repent of your wrong. You, you, you now they add things in there, and we'll talk about that when we get to doctrine. Mm -hmm. When we start discussing that stuff about penance and confessing to priests and all that other kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. but, the, but the underlying presupposition is that you're no good. You do wrong. You can't do right. You're never going to amount to anything. And uh, those things played a role in my own salvation because I knew I was no good. I knew what I was doing was sin. I knew my conscience was um, alive and well, and I can credit that to my Catholic upbringing. So mm -hmm. if we can discuss these types of things and, and bring this stuff out and how powerful it is in the lives of the Catholics that you might know, if you can understand where they're coming from, it might help you be able uh, a better witness to them, or uh, instead of come out guns a blazing, um, get your Baptist with, bazooka out. Yeah, right. And if you can put the straw man back in the cornfield <laughs> and address reality and have an open ear to listen to Catholics, you're going right. to don't, a, don't assume that every yeah. Roman Catholic is part of a, a dark conspiracy of the papacy and all this other crazy right. stuff. You know, not everything right. is a chick comic book. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we're not, we don't all know Alberto, you know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> you know, so, so my testimony, I don't have anything negative to say about my Catholic upbringing other than the fact that they didn't give me the salvation doctrine as right. the scripture details it. But as far as the home and the upbringing it, a devout Catholic would have, um, it's very good. So, if we so tell me about that a little bit. Tell me about that a little bit. Let's let let me ask you some questions about that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, growing up at a young age, okay, you're you're mm -hmm. you're a child and you're growing up, and I'm assuming you're learning catechisms and you're learning other things. You're going to church every week, right? Is it once or right. twice a week? What is it? Once a week. Once a week, you would go to church, mm -hmm. and you went to a Catholic school. Then most of your life. Yeah. Or? That's right. Okay. I can say in, in my neighborhood, okay, this is why they have parishes. Now, what is a parish? A parish isn't just the church building. Now, that's okay. usually what a non-Catholic thinks about a parish. Is, is they hear the word parish and they think, okay, well, St. Mike's Parish is that St. Mike's church building, and, and St. John's Parish is that church building. That's not how it works. It, uh, it, is, it is sort of now, but that's not, not what the original intention of a parish is. And you can understand that when you think about Louisiana. The state of Louisiana, they don't have counties, they have parishes, right? Okay. It's a geographical area. You see what I mean? So a Roman Catholic parish would be a geographical area. The church would be the mission, the, 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 the lighthouse in that geographical area that you would go to to have uh, the sacraments administered to you. But if you lived in a parish, you were underneath the authority of that Roman Catholic geographical area. It, but it didn't work that way in the United States because it was a Catholic nation. Mm -hmm. But but this is how it's to be understood as far from a Roman Catholic sense. And so in my parish, that includes my neighborhood in, in the parish that I lived in, most of the kids in that neighborhood went to that school. Uh, most of the mothers, um, and there were exceptions, but most of the mothers, and we're talking about in the in the seventies, the early seventies. Well, through the seventies was when I went to grade school, and at that time, most of the mothers were at home, and so the whole neighborhood I could couldn't go anywhere without someone's mom watching me. You know, you keep an eye on you on the street. Absolutely. So it was that kind of an upbringing. And it was very similar. So all the kids in my that, that I knew were raised similarly to the way I was raised. And so we did everything together, right? And I'm talking about scores of kids 
Mm -hmm. you know, lots of children my age. We went to church together. We were on the same sports teams together. Our parents all knew one another because of and the they, church. And they had happy lives for the most part, the kids. I mean, you Absolutely. know, they, they, got it, they got instruction. They got direction, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. correction. Yes. You know, affection Correction from others, you know, from others' right. parents. You you learn to respect other people's parents. Um, you learn pretty much a lot of biblical truth um, through that type of an upbringing, and so everything was done together. And so the premium was put on family and community, and so um, even our parents, like I was starting to say, there our parents, they had moms' clubs and dads' clubs, and the dads had a softball team and we'd all go watch our dads play softball and the moms would be there so it's, it's like everywhere you went it revolved around the, you know the priests would come to the games uh, and, and all that kind of stuff and so it was like this giant community right and so it was it was pretty traditional like you mentioned earlier the word traditions and traditional and it was all pretty wholesome and I don't remember anything negative about it and it taught us a lot of biblical truths although it did teach us some things that weren't and that led to by the time i got into my teenage years i started questioning some things doctrinally but mm -hmm. but at the same time accepting that the life and the culture was still um, a pretty good thing to have experienced and so i know there's somebody listening to this that can relate to what i'm saying and that's good because if we can at least admit this and say this then we can at put that aside at some point and get into the doctrine and show where doctrinally these good people are wrong. You see right. what I'm saying? These good I people do. with good, with these good people with good intentions, um, with no and maliciousness. Would you say, so you would say that you would say that in growing up these people around you, uh, the, these people, they, they had good intentions. They, they were Absolutely. kind to each other. They loved each other. They had good yeah. intentions. They loved their children, and they tried to raise them in all that they knew was right in God's eyes. Absolutely. And I'll, let me put it to you like this, because you might understand this with a Baptist background. And any Baptists that are listening to me, Baptist and a Baptist, you might understand this, that um, when you go to church, okay, you see all your Baptist friends, right? And then uh, you're being taught the truth and doctrine and scripture and you're opening your Bibles and you're singing hymns, but then you go home and then you go back to work and you don't see those people till next week. Mm -hmm. In the Roman Catholic culture, you see these people all week, every single day. And so it's, it's, a, it's a bigger thing. You're, these are your neighbors. These are your friends. These are the families that are in your life. You're doing things together that aren't church. Right, so when you're on the, the the boys' baseball team and the girls' softball team, uh, and you're you're at school every day with all these kids and the moms picking them up, and so it's boys. actually their it's actually their life. Exactly, that's what I'm trying to say. So the Ro Roman Catholicism, at least in the upbringing that I know and of the people that I know that were raised this way, it covered every aspect of your life every aspect of your life. So it wasn't just a going to church on a Sunday thing. The Catholic life was every single day. And so like when you're at church, you know, you feel accountable to the brethren there, you know, you're, 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 you're doing right. Your outward appearance conforms to what's going on around you. You had that accountability seven days a week. Do you see what I'm saying? So, so it's a, it's a quite powerful thing in the life of a Catholic who's raised that way. And to hear someone just come out blasting Roman Catholicism, it's going to be pretty hard for them to accept unless you can at least acknowledge what we're trying to acknowledge right now. Makes sense. Because uh, that it's not all bad, right? Right, right. That makes sense. Because if you don't, if you don't do that, then what happens is it becomes disingenuous. People aren't going to listen exactly. to what you to say because they're like, okay, listen, now we understand that you know, even if you give people, you know, the Alberto series and the, you know, and, and Charles Chinnaquee and the Jesuits and all those other things, which right. a lot of those are true. A lot of those things are true, but they're not the normal. Okay. They're, they're exactly. not, that's not the norm. And to try to convince people that this is the normal of most Catholics lives, it's like a Mormon. Exactly. Most of these Mormons or these Jehovah's Witnesses, mm -hmm. most of them, they don't have the the testimony of you know of 
having a rotten life. A lot of them don't. I mean, I suppose right. some of them do, but right. not all of them, just like anywhere else you go. But mm-hmm. you're not going to convince them that they're that they're that they need to leave their church because of atrocities alone. You know, that's right. not going to be enough. And if they never experience any of those atrocities, then they think you're nuts. But well, what, well, what do you think? The re, what do you think the response to that is? The response is, okay, they'll bring up the equivalent Baptists that right. do the same thing. So they just undermined your argument. You can't argue that because right. they have they have so much of their daily life that was impacted for the good that you pointing out one atrocity isn't enough to overcome what they know their entire what, life. What what they know from a daily basis. And their entire right? life. Exactly. So you can't address it at that level. You have to be able to talk Bible and talk doctrine. And uh, again, uh, I found out that what I thought uh, the church taught, they didn't actually teach. Mm-hmm. So when you talk to Roman Catholics, and like I have in public ministry, after my salvation, I found out that most, I shouldn't say most, I'll just say many Roman Catholics do not even believe what their church teaches because they don't even know that's not what their church teaches. For example, I'll give you one real quick one. They do not understand the difference between consubstantiation and transubstantiation when you're talking about um, the community. The bread and wine turning it, into actual right. they, they don't. Yeah, they don't understand the difference between what Protestants teach and what Catholics, they they don't even know there is a difference. Most of them, I'll say, well, I don't want to use the word most, because just many. I'll just use the word many. Many that you have run across and that you've been around. It would be most that I have run across. But so I'll, if I use the word many, that, that covers even people I don't know. So they don't even know what their own church teaches. Uh, and that's why, you know, in this series, we're going to bring out the the catechism and, and any Roman Catholic that, that is brave enough to listen to the series, um, they may find out that they don't even believe what their own church teaches for the first time. Yep, yep. And, you know, it's funny because you go back to Martin Luther and it's the same thing. It wasn't atrocities and evils of Rome. It was the truth of the gospel that spoke mm-hmm. to his heart, you know, and uh, and others like him when they were leaving Roman Catholicism and such, they they saw the truth of, well, this is what we believe, and if you find out that your church stands for something that you don't believe, then that's gonna that's gonna have an impact on you. Exactly, or or you may find out that your church church teaches something that you cannot digest or mm-hmm. accept, right? And you might just not you just might not know about it. And a lot of that stuff I didn't even know about mm-hmm. until after I was saved and then really started reading my Bible for the first time and studying the Bible and what it has to say and how, where I finally learned for the first time after I was saved where a lot of the problems were. And um, so we're going to deal with that you know, yep. as we go through the series and we'll, we'll see where the Lord takes it um, and what your direction is because this is your, your idea to have yeah. a series so, so we'll, we'll see where it goes but I wanted to mention how, how good my upbringing was it, it wasn't this dark conspiratorial evil thing uh, that is typically <laughs> brought out by people that were never raised in a Catholic home and have no idea what they're talking about and so it's all I could do over the years to not just roll my eyes at what I would hear non-Catholics say about Catholics and so we're trying to dispel that right now. Uh, yep. we're, we're trying to help people understand, learn to distinguish between the Roman Catholic person and Roman Catholic doctrine, because the intent of Roman Catholics, generally speaking, is pure and good. It's why they have soup kitchens and you don't. It's why they right. give you know clothes to the poor and you don't. And let's talk about that because it's that, why oh, they invented hospitals. It's why they, I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's, they've done so many good things more than Baptists that I know that yes. it's it, sometimes it, 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 it is amazing to me that Baptists can even hold some of these negative positions about Roman Catholicism when they couldn't hold a candle to their the charity works, the works that, that the Roman Catholic Church does, of course, we know works don't 
do not save anyone. They do not convert anyone into a new creature. And that's probably some of the motivation why those people work so hard too, you know, because not because they're not genuine, but because they believe their good outweighs their bad. I've heard a lot of Roman Catholics say that to me that, you know, well, my good's going to outweigh my bad, or I hope my good. They won't, they, won't, they won't even say it's their good. Um, Cause I've heard people say that the Roman Catholics do not believe it's even their good. That is God working through them because there is none good but God. They'll admit that. So anything good that they do is God's grace bestowed upon them to do it. Okay. It's not even it's not even coming from them. This is something that God has given them the grace to do. Okay. Through the church. So And that's and that's what they're taught. Yes. And so and well that's what the catechism will tell you too. I I've, I've I've read read through it um, in recent years with I've read through the I've I've read portions of the Roman Catholic catechism more after I've been born again than, than I did before. <laughs> and that's because I needed to know my stuff when I was talking to people about doctrine sure. because, of, because of so many Catholics in my life. So I would get challenged on those things. And so, so w just, just take for, for example, that you are a Roman Catholic and someone comes and starts telling you all about God, how to go to heaven, how to be saved about the Bible but you look they're looking at your life and they're they're saying uh why should i listen to you because look at these other people and look at all the good they're doing and you're not doing anything all you're doing is running your mouth you're not these people over here are sacrificing and doing good unto others and giving and they're selfless and all that other kind of stuff and you're not doing anything but running your mouth so yeah. It's 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 a tough situation. You've got to tip your hat to it, um, and that's why Baptists need to be all about it. Not talking about it, but be about it. That you need that's to right. walk the talk, not just talk the talk. And that's why you need to walk in newness of life. This is why Baptists need to understand the Bible and what it implores them to do. They're ordained unto good works. Yeah, I think it's like, I'm trying to think how many times, but it might be eight times, but I'm not sure that good works is mentioned in the Absolutely. New Testament. Like, I think it's eight times, maybe, with the new right. life, you know. Uh, and that, where, that's, that's where the election comes in. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm not talking about Calvinism, because I'm not a Calvinist. What I'm talking about, the word elect means, okay, for example, um, you elect a mayor. Well, we'll make it even simpler. You elect a dog catcher. Mm -hmm. Well, you didn't elect him, so he can just say, I'm elected. You elected him to do the job. So mm -hmm. he volunteered for it. He mm -hmm. was elected, and now he is supposed to do his job. That's the same with the Christian. That's what the election even means. You, 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 you volunteered. <laughs> You've been elected then to perform good works. So why aren't you holding up your end of the bargain? So this is where even Baptist doctrine needs to start to really have rubber meat road. Mm -hmm. And this is where you get into repentance and this is where you get into the, the whole change life and the new creature and well, all those it's, other it's, things. It's Ephesians uh, 2, 8, 9, and 10. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created mm -hmm. in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath That's before right. ordained, yeah. and we should That's walk right. in them. That's yeah, right. exactly. So, and when that's so lacking, it's bad. Right, and to stay, to stay on topic without going on to that too, too far, I don't want to go too far afield, we're talking about Roman Catholics who are actually performing verse 10 while you're running a your mouth about verse 8 and 9. It's true. So how are you going <laughs> to reach these people when you don't have the cachet to back up what your what your mouth is, mm -hmm. you don't have, you know what I'm saying. So yep. so this is why we have to tip our hat, we're, we're, and, and give it and give due honor to where the honor should be due, but at the same time understand that doctrinally there's a problem there, and we're going to deal with that, and um, and that's how how masterful the devil is, is he can get you almost right. Mm -hmm. And you don't have the discernment to understand the difference between what's right and almost right. And so that's why we want to have the series. At least I, I'm speaking for myself. I think that's why we want to have this series yes. is, is to teach people to um, Baptists, especially saved people. I'll put it like that. Born again people 
to understand the Roman Catholic a little bit better because most of what you are hearing about Roman Catholics isn't even true. It's a mm -hmm. caricature of it. It's an overblown. Uh, it's hyperbole. It's 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 taking these like you said atrocities and and painting the whole thing with it. And you, it's not fair. It's not right. And coming from the inside and knowing better myself, I think it's helpful to acknowledge. Um, the life that a Roman Catholic may have led is not quite like what you think it is. And so you're approaching them already from a bad position if you start blasting everything they've understood. You know what I mean? That's kind, of why, I'm, that's kind of why I'm trying to say, hey, my, my Roman Catholic upbringing was awesome. It was, it was outstanding. Okay, and, good. Um, so your, your history with them is good. Now, tell me Okay, so you grew up, you gra I assume you graduated high school, the Roman Catholic high school. Right. Okay, yes. then did you go to a school after that, a Roman Catholic school after that, a college or no? No, no I, I did not. There, there are Roman Catholic colleges, and of course, Notre Dame being a famous one. Okay. Um, over there in Indiana, and I know some friends who did go there, and there's several others, Georgetown on the East Coast, and DePaul, and there's many others. But no, I yep. did not. I went to a community college, and then... Uh, Part of my personal testimony is, is I was just too um, immature to um, handle the freedom that I had uh, because my life was so structured up to that point um, that when I was finally old enough to where I had to decide everything myself, um, I ended up moving out of the house and making all kinds of foolish decisions mm. and nearly, nearly destroyed myself in the process. Although looking back, it was all good, good learning. Um, but at the time, those were just not very wise decisions on my part. So you're so you went against your Catholic upbringing and the scruples that you were taught, or the principles you were taught, and you know the guidance that you were taught, and kind of went into yes. the world uh, into sin more. And it became and it and it really started. It started in my teenage years when I started thinking for myself. And I can only say for myself, one of the one of the things that bothered me the most was having to to tell another man what my sins were, and mm -hmm. that just didn't sit right with me. So, uh, you know, as all young people do, they they have to start thinking for themselves, and they start questioning what their parents have told them, and then they've got other outside influences in their lives. Because when sure. I went to high school, I was out of that community now because this high school was not in our community. So I, I, I'm, so now we, ha we have kids from other Catholic parishes all going to that. It was an all boys college prep school, which is the best way to teach boys, by the way. Um, if you wanna teach them academics, there's no distractions at an all boys college prep school. Um, but yeah, anyway, girl, so, girls can distract you very easily. Oh, and they, and they do so with intent. <laughs> so, you know, they could destroy your whole life. And Proverbs 7 is a real thing. Yep. But anyway, um, so, you know, I started questioning doctrine. See, and this is why the series is going to be necessary. I wasn't questioning the upbringing but because there was safety in that. But, but I started questioning doctrine. I just didn't understand if God was this God who's made everything and all powerful and all knowing, why can't he know? Why can't I just pray to him? Why do I have to pray through some guy? You know what I mean? Mm. So, so I started questioning the Roman Catholic package, the doctrinal package, not the, not the cultural package, but the doctrinal package that they set before me. And I didn't quite understand it. So I pretty much chucked religion, but I didn't ever chuck God. So, mm -hmm. I got born again in October of, or September of 1990. So at that time I was 24, almost 25 years old. And I'd been on my own at that point by about seven years because I was 17, almost 18 when I moved out of my parents' home. I graduated when I was 17. So man, I might have been 18 already at that point. But, um, and I almost destroyed myself. But, mm. uh, I never did give up on God and without getting into all the details of my personal testimony, cause we'd be here for a very long time. I got some chick tracks 
that started to make some sense because I never did give up on God, but I went on a journey to find find God, and 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 I even studied under Jehovah Witness for a year. I ran into wow. a guy. At, I ran into a guy at work who was a devout Jehovah Witness, and he was having little studies out of their Red Book. And because of my questions, he seemed to have answers. And so I started studying with him for about a year. But that didn't ring ring right after a while either. So I was on like this spiritual journey, and then and pieces to the puzzle started to click. I got my hand on some chick tracks in perfect timing. A chick track uh, came into my life uh, perfectly so, timed. Where and did you I, find that chick track at? I found it at a friend's house, um, and I stole it. And it f sounds funny because you can't really steal. Can you steal a chick track? Can Probably you? not. I mean, because they want you to have them anyway, right? But I didn't know that. It was just a cartoon book, right? It was a little comic book. And how old and were I, you? At this point, I'm 24, and it's okay. the spring. It's the spring of 1990, and I take this chick track and I stick it in my leather jacket in the pocket. Well, because it was spring, it was either the last time I wore the jacket or real close to that. I hung the jacket up in my closet, home, and uh, forgot I even had it. Well, here comes September, and the first breeze of cold weather comes through. I grabbed my coat. Well, the timing of this was perfect because circumstances in my life at that time were such that this track hit me like a bowling ball. And, wow. um, and I read through the track and the scriptures because I found the track and I'm like, which track was it? Do you remember? I, I don't remember the title of it, but I remember it was a yellow one. So I don't, I don't remember. I'd have to go back and look at, all the, the covers, yeah. Tracks. Yeah, and kind of go back through. I don't think it was that funny guy because that I know that one's yellow, that funny guy. Um, and that was more of a caricature of Steve Martin, the comedian. It's kind of a caricature of him at the time. But anyway, it was a yellow chick track, but it was the Bible verses that hit me, mm -hmm. right? So you know how chick tracks are. You know they have the little conversation, the dialogue between the characters, and then at the bottom it would be like an uh, an asterisk in the conversation, and then the asterisk will, asterisk will direct you to a Bible verse in the in the bottom of the page, mm -hmm. and those Bible verses would really hit me, and they all had to do with repentance and and then uh, turning to Jesus and trusting Him for your salvation, and so. Um, you know, I already knew I was a sinner. I learned that for 20 some years from the Catholic Church. I already knew that. So, so this was just resonating. And that, again, that's where I credit the Catholic Church because they get you almost there. And, uh, the, but this unlocked the answer to it, right? Mm -hmm. This, this, this unlocked the solution, which was Jesus Christ and the finished work yeah. on the cross and no need for the church. And you just place your faith in, in Calvary and, uh, and Jesus will, cleanse you with his blood and from all your sins and he gives you newness of life and of course all this stuff happened to me in an instant when I repented of my sins and trusted Jesus Christ Amen. at that moment he saved me I became born again although I didn't know all that I didn't know I didn't know all that but I, I know now looking back at my own personal salvation testimony knowing the Bible as well as I do now I know exactly what happened to me and I know I know I was born again at that moment there's no question in my, in my mind because mm -hmm. I was changed from that second from yeah. that second I was changed instantly um, and everyone's salvation testimony is a little different than mine but I went from cursing like a sailor to to, to not cursing at all everyone knew something happened to me everyone knew would just say what's what what's wrong with you what happened to you I didn't have to say anything. They knew something was different. Wow. My speech was different. My mannerisms were different. But I, uh, I, uh, all I knew to answer them at the time when they asked me was, um, I was, I've been born again. And of course I lost all my friends, you know, and I, I wasn't as fun as I don't blame them. I wasn't as fun as I was before. Right. Because sure. young people in the party and crowd and all that other kind of stuff. Of course I'm not doing that anymore. And so I, I pretty much lost all my friends. And, sure. Um, you know, the rest is history, and here we are today in 2000, the end of 2018, and we're talking about it. But 
Amen. So you uh, got so you got saved at 24 years old. You had heard right. the God, you had heard you know the law a schoolmaster really to bring you to Christ and that you were a sinner and you grew up religious in the Roman Catholic Church so they're teaching you about God the Father God the Son God the Holy Ghost you're learning right. about uh, all those things albeit you're learning other doctrines that are wrong that we're going to talk about but the one doctrine but that all that you you just needed the last you needed Christ you needed to know that right. Christ was your right. meeting exactly right and and the, and, the, and the liberty and the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, because the Roman Catholic doctrine doesn't really give you a solution. In other words, um, the church is the solution. And so so um, it keeps you finished... dependent on the church. Exactly. I, I remember talking to people. There's a Lutheran that was like this too, a Lutheran. Uh, priest or pastor, I don't know what they call themselves, but I remember talking to him when I first got saved, and he said, and he said to me, I said, is there any salvation outside of the church? And he said, no. Yeah, right. Yeah, so that, that is what the Roman Catholic Church teaches. The right. Is, so no, there's not, because they are the, the instrument whereby uh, God bestows upon you his grace to merit your salvation in the first place. See, because it's not an instant. Salvation to them isn't a birth. Salvation to them is is a transition over time through the sacraments to hopefully get you there. But then again, you've got your, your purgatory deal, and then over time, you can finally make it there. But um, they make heaven the goal and so I think this is part of the problem with Baptist teaching mm -hmm. is that we don't emphasize enough of what we've already talked about already about the newness of life that Romans yep. chapter 6 talks about because as a former Roman Catholic, I found this to be true. There's several other ones in our church here, and I've run into a bunch of others that have become born again Christians. And one of the things, one of the problems they encounter is, is because they've always understood heaven to be the goal, salvation to be heaven, that when they got born again, it's over, it's done, I've been saved, I'm, I'm done. But, but the Bible doesn't teach that, see, that they carry that those presuppositions over into their salvation experience, and so because heaven was the goal and they already have eternal life and everlasting life and you can't lose it, then it, I've already attained the goal. Well, that's not it. <laughs> Salvation is birth. It's the start. Yes. It's a new birth. It's the start of finally living newness of life, finally living eternal life that you have now. It's not something you get when you die. You don't get eternal life then. You don't just have the promise of eternal life. For when you when you when your body dies, you have it now, so walk in newness of life now. Amen. And, and that's where Baptist teaching really has dropped the ball because – there's there's several reasons for that. One being that they think every service is supposed to be evangelistic, and they bring in busloads of the lost into the service, which they're not supposed to do in the first place. That's a topic we can discuss. We've discussed that. Sure. Or evangelism is supposed to be done outside the church. The church is supposed to be the feeding of the sheep that are already Amen. saved, and we're not doing that. And we're mixed the two, and it's caused a lot of people to stumble and starve. And, you know, you know, this could, you know, we, we don't have time to go on that rabbit trail because we could right. go on a lot of those. Oh, yeah, but I, I think it's interesting, though, that, you know, one thing that really sticks out to me is what Baptists need to do more of. And I would say that's expository preaching verse Absolutely. by verse through the book of Romans. Because, and I've never done it myself, but I'm, I'm getting excited. I want to do it because Romans, the book of Romans really lays out the gospel and the gospel life. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, the first eight chapters are all about justification by faith. You know, chapter one, you know, Gentiles are no good. Chapter two, the Jews are no good. Chapter three, we're all no good. <laughs> you know? And then it just walks you through the whole thing. Brother, because have you taught uh, through Romans? Have you taught through? Yes, I, I have, verse okay. by verse, all the way through. Okay, and, yeah. That's... And you're right. It's It's powerful. It's it's absolutely powerful. And of course, that was the book I think that really shook up uh, Martin Luther too. I've read his uh, commentaries on on the Book of Romans and Galatians, yeah. 
<laughs> Galatians, Ephesians, all of that. But but anyway, you know, as far as the Roman Catholic is concerned, if you're listening to this right now, um, you you if you did have an umbr good upbringing, you did. It was good. It was worthwhile. It was it was all good intentioned. It was all um, what you know it to be in how important family is and the premium that the Roman Catholic Church puts on family and marriage. Those things are awesome. Mm -hmm. And you were taught good on those things, but you were also not taught fully. And there's some things that are left out. And that that's the part that we intend to fill in on the series. But in the introduction here, we wanted to take the time to acknowledge your upbringing and acknowledge the good that your parents and grandparents did in your life in doing the best they could to get you um, the religious understanding and training that they thought as best they knew how. Yes. Right? Incomplete, but the best they knew how to raise you properly. And if you're in a good place in your life now, then they did a good job. And we can acknowledge that. And we can be yep. thankful for that. And we can thank God for it even. Mm -hmm. But let's let's get to where we can understand the difference between the Roman Catholic life, the Roman Catholic culture, and the Roman Catholic doctrine, most of which most Catholics, many Catholics, are not even aware of. And, um, and we hope to bring that to light in this series so that we can help people get to the finish line, get, get, get across that salvation line, I'll put it. Exactly. We want you to be saved. Our goal is that you would have peace through the Lord Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. that you would understand Amen. and be born again by the Spirit of God and have a new life in Christ Jesus. That doesn't erase all the good that ever happened to you Correct. Uh, right. in the past. It doesn't. It doesn't. In fact, you know, God uses our past. God uses it. Uh, you know, wherever we came from to help us in the future. He uses those lessons that we learned and things like that. But we care for your soul. And we want you to understand that your lessons are not complete. Uh, but the Bible has the answer for eternal life. And the Amen. Bible has the answer for justification and, and, for, and for sanctification and, you know, and for the, the, right, the right focus on good works and all of those things, you know, God, right. God shows us and teaches us from his word, those things. And that's for the Catholic people that are listening here. Uh, that's, that's where we're headed. That's what we're right. trying to do. That's we're right. trying to, we're trying to help you with that, to see the truth of that. And, you know, we, we care for your souls. So that's why we're doing what we're doing. So we started out with brother Ickes's testimony here of you know, a good, a good life that, that he grew up in from that standpoint and that God, you know, uh, was good to him and, and the people that, that took care of it is Catholic parish. They were like families and they, they were family and they were, they were kind and the priests were kind to him. And the, mm -hmm. I, I assume the nuns were kind to you. You probably got oh, slapped. Yeah. Did you get slapped on the hand with a ruler? Or? Uh, yeah, they had a paddle. I remember sister Vianne in first grade, had this paddle and it was, if I remember right, it had the holes in it. So you get a little bit more velocity on it. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, uh, yeah, they, they got you in line right away. You know, you're six years old, but you, you got in line and, and that wasn't a bad thing. That was a good no, thing. It taught you respect. But see, it taught the kids order. I mean, there was order authority, all those real good bit. Those are biblical principles. Yes. Those are, those are things that are true. Those are right. Those are good. And, and, and we learned all of that stuff. Now, when I got to high school, Father Donner, he had a, he would pull your hair. He'd grab you by the top of your head. He would grab all the way down right by the root of your hair so it would really hurt. He'd make you stand up. If you talked out of line or whatever, he disrespected him while he was trying to teach. You got uh, publicly humiliated, and he didn't do that again. And then I remember <laughs> Father, Father Menner, Father Menner was an algebra teacher. He'd punch you right in the chest. Because remember, these are all boys, right? Yeah. So the so they're they're like, okay, we're they're treating us like young men. So it's like uh, they knew what what young men needed. They didn't need this pampering. They didn't need well. He that taught kind you that he taught so, that you so you, you, you can't call, That's <laughs> you right. Can't he call, man, you're gonna get it. 
That's right. And he, he, you'd get called up to the board to finish an algebraic equation or something. And if you didn't know the answer, if you're smart about it, it wasn't just if you didn't know the answer, but if you were kind of maybe wisecracking and so he caught you not paying attention. So then he'd be like, all right, come on up.